Let's face it, interviewing professional athletes is kind of tough. First off, elocution isn't exactly their thing. We're going to have to be ready to go, hopefully right off the bat. Yeah, I thought we got off to a slow start. I thought it was a good overall team effort. Give them credit, they played a really good third period. We, we weren't good enough, so. Even a fair question can seem to tick them off. What, if anything, at this stage of your career creates pressure for you? Rings about pressure. Nothing. Didn't I just tell you don't ask me that? Yeah, but you know. You okay. out the conclusion. Turn around, go back, go you. back that way. Bye, see you. So it's been a journey to get here, man. Give us an idea of what, what it feels like to be back on fight week again. I'm just here because I have to be here. Down to the ice, here's Kyle with Brad Marchand. Thanks, Jim. Brad, you said after the third game of the series, there's no panic in the room. What can you say about the way your group handled the next three games and ultimately advancing to the conference final? We did a good job. Even the coaches are tough to deal with sometimes. In my opinion, that sucked. What's that? Uh, playoffs? Don't talk about playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. There's three quarterbacks on this football team. Whichever one starts, starts. Whichever ones don't, we'll back them up. Period. Cut and dry. It's nobody's concern but ours. Nobody's. Next. Injuries from the uh, game. Talk to the trainer. Next. All right, I'm Mike, why are you in such a bad mood? If you were two and seven, you'd be in a bad mood too. And to be fair, the questions themselves are sometimes kind of dumb. Uh, Wayne, what's the difference? I mean, it didn't make any difference in the seating, but what's the difference between 3-3 three, three and 3-2? Three, Probably the biggest difference is what you guys write. Today on Stories and Strategies, we speak with professional broadcaster Bryn Griffiths, who knows the art and science of interviews with professional athletes. My name is Doug Downs. My guest this episode is Bryn Griffiths, joining us from Edmonton. Hello, Bryn. Hello, Doug. How are you? Good to get together. Uh, Bryn has been in broadcasting for 33 years behind the microphone, but also strategically planning and designing the content on the sales side of the business, as well as leadership roles. He's contributed media reports from many world-class sporting events, including this is amazing. Six Stanley Cup finals, seven Grey Cups, and two Super Bowls. Bryn knows the broadcast booth, and he knows the locker room. Bryn, uh, first off, would you agree that there is um, a nuance to interviewing professional athletes, part art, part uh, science? I think there's a natural ability to interview athletes. The biggest thing for me isn't getting the information you ultimately want to get. The biggest thing for me is getting the athlete to relax. And so for me, the person who I'm interviewing, it's got to be a conversation like you and I talking right now. I, I guess the best way for me to break it down is that if you walk away from an interview and it's really kind of crappy, all you got to do is walk down the hallway, take the first door to the left, you're in the men's room, look in that mirror, and there's the person to blame for a bad interview. Mm. I think blaming the athlete is, is a pretty big cop-out. I, I, I only think you're as good as the person you're interviewing. Okay, so you're saying basically help them let their guard down, but that's the thing they don't want to do. No, and it takes a little bit of time. If you're a beat reporter, it's far easier because you see the guy, you see the guy every day. So you're able to maybe just develop a little bit of a friendship. However, it can also work the other way. Mm -hmm. There are some guys that just don't want to talk to you because they don't like your style. And that's why you also see guys, the, the newspaper and the uh, electronic media love to go back to guys that one can talk and two are not afraid to let that wall down. But I think it's getting tougher. Was there one conversation with a professional athlete that stands out to you in your career? Well, well I have two that stick out for me. The, the real game changer for me was with Ed Hervey, who's now with the British Columbia Lions in the CFL. But Ed played with the Edmonton Eskimos for years. Ed was a very emotional kind of guy and never failed to give you a good quote or a clip. Ed had just retired from the Edmonton Eskimos. His playing career was over. And uh, my co-host at what, what is now TSN 1260 – Back in the day when we launched, it was part of the team network across the country. And I, I had to fill in on this one show, which was kind of a specialty show. It was an hour more in depth. 
And, you know, of course, so I did my 10 fire starter questions. Within the first three minutes, we're talking about Ed's speed. And Ed casually said to me, he says, well, when you grew up in Compton, you had to be fast. Oh, wow. And I, you know, I only thought of Ed from the Los Angeles area. But now he zoomed in on Compton, and of course Compton's got quite the reputation. And so on my uh, my sheet, basically telling me the direction I wanted to go with the interview, because I had listened, I went, "You grew up in Compton," and it was like somebody opened the magic door. And we talked about Ed surviving Compton and how he got started with his career, how he watched a very good friend of his get. Uh, shot in the head hmm. it, 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 so all of a sudden now we've gone down a completely different street or avenue than i'd ever imagined with this interview and we had a text line and all of a sudden i was expecting the usual stick to football that kind of stuff coming up on the text line guys were guys had jumped in with me deep into the interview because they'd never heard the compton side of it before for me i i just i learned so much more about ed in that time than the five to seven years that I covered him. Who, who was the other athlete that stands out to you? The other athlete was John Cornish, who was a great running back for the Calgary Stampeders. And I was working on a show with, with Pat Steinberg. We were doing the afternoon show on the, the, the Fan 960 in Calgary. And John came in studio. I think it might have, might have been off season. And... You know, so and John, John's not was not a uh, an easy interview. John was talking about uh, growing up with a single mom, mm. and and through the uh, conversation, uh, he took us he took us in all different directions, and I got more I was more fascinated by those directions than I was to talk about the fact that he gained nine yards per carry. Sometimes those interviews got to go a little bit different and into a little different realm than just the basic sports stuff. And that, that to me is a real success formula for a conversation or an interview. It's just trying to find something a little different, even if you have to go a different, different route to get there. I like what you did there, characterizing it as a conversation and not so much um, an interview. So yeah. let's let's shift on uh, to interactions with coaches. <laughs> Have you oh, had yeah. a, a bad experience with a coach? I've been involved in a couple. Uh, I have not been the, uh, the, the instigator in any of those. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, though, there was one when I was working in Moose Jaw at CHAB Radio. And, I, of course – you got to cover the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. So you go in for every game. And for me, I enjoyed that half-hour journey in. It was uh, both uh, exciting heading in to Regina. I know for some people that sounds weird. Uh, I, I've always – I liked Regina, and I loved going in for rider games. But I really enjoyed the cleansing tr trip back to Moose Jaw after games because it could get a little tense. We had a coach, John Gregory, who uh, was a fiery individual. And I, I got along r really quite well with John. We were at this one game, and he made a, a – I'll say – I'm going to call it a strange call – late in the third period – or third period, a th fourth quarter, where he should have gone for a touchdown. They were down uh, on the two-yard line. But he decided to kick a field goal, which did not give them the lead or tie the game. So, uh, and sure enough, they never got the football back. So they never had a chance to win it. Well, and you got to ask. Absolutely. So I'm walking down the walkway from the press box in old Taylor field. And all you can hear are the fans going, why didn't he go for the touchdown? Mm -hmm. why? I don't understand that. That's a strange call. Okay. So ultimately your goal is to go down to any locker room, talk to any athlete or any coach about, uh, you know, the questions that the fans want an answer to. I got beat to this one by uh, Nick Miliokas of the Regina Leader Post, but because he's a beat writer, John was a, is a little was a little more. I don't think he liked Nick, and he just started. He blew up. He goes, "That is a dumb question. That is the stupidest question." And you can see, you could almost see he was his face is starting to turn red. We're going to have a Mount Vesuvius here in about thirty seconds. He's going to explode, and of course he did. And he had a piece of chalk in his hand. 
and he threw it at Nick. I'm standing right next to Nick, and we both kind of split, and the check, the the chalk hit the wall behind us. And then I jumped in. I go, John, that's not a dumb question because on the walk down from the press box, we just had heard about 20 fans wondering why. So our job to come down here is to ask you why. We're not second guessing. And he calmed down and answered the question through his anger. I got a call from John the next day apologizing for throwing chalk uh, toward me, even though he said it was more meant for Nick. But it doesn't matter. The, the key with the coaches is to try to make the questions less, uh, less antagonistic. And the other thing, too, I've always, I've always told athletes and I've always told co coaches, I'm not second-guessing you on anything. I'm just curious. What I hear there is the involvement of emotion in professional sport and how you as playing a role in that as a media interviewer uh, needs to find your spot. So tell me about the, there's three different spots for emotion and the interviews. One is when there's no game involved. You talked about John Cornish coming into the studio to do an interview during the off season. Another is a uh, pregame or pre-match before they're about to go out there and, and engage in battle. And the other is post game or post match. What are the three different kinds of emotions and how would you approach the interviews differently for each? Well, when you're dealing with the home team, to me, the most important one is getting to practices. That's the best place, especially afterwards, because you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I've always had a rule. If, the, if my microphone is in your face, it's on the record. The moment I drop my microphone or I turn my recorder off or whatever device I was using, it's off the record. Uh, and then the post-game stuff is all set up by what you did in the practices. If there's a trust level between you and the athlete on the, on the home team, you'll be amazed at what you'll get. And, and it can happen, too, sometimes with, with athletes who are from out of town. And I, I stumbled on an Eric Lindros one. Let me just quickly throw this one at you. For some reason, I, I, I got down to the Flyers locker room before the rest of the Edmonton media. And Eric Lindros had just scored in overtime. All the other guys are up in the press box. And I just happened to be standing downstairs by their room. And they just happened to be opening up the locker room at the same time. I said, oh, you're not going to wait the five minutes for the boys to cool down? Like, no, go on in. So I'm si sitting right beside Eric as he's taking his jersey off, which is really unusual for a media person to be in that position. They're usually – these players have got their five minutes to cool down to get their quotes – ready to go like that. Oh, well, you just take it one period of time. You know, right. we've heard them all. Yeah. And all I said to Eric, and I didn't even use a question. I go, wow, that was pretty crazy. And he just went and he gave me about a 40 second clip about what a crazy game it was. And then of course the rest of the media guys came in and I saw that wall start to go up. That protective athletic wall went up. I got the best quote of them all uh, because I got the true emotion out of him. And that's a, that's a great example. Let me play for you a bad example. It, it's a more or less a parody scene from a movie. It's a yeah. clip from, from the 2000 movie Bedazzled with Brendan Fraser, distributed by 20th Century Fox. In this scene, Fraser has been granted a magical wish to be the greatest basketball athlete of all time, but not exactly the greatest interview of all time. Bob is courtside with Elliot Richards. Now let's go to Bob Bob. Thank you, Jerry and Dan. Elliot, you must be one very proud young man this evening. Simply put, that was a staggeringly dramatic display of athletic ability. Uh, well, you know, you go out there and you give 110% and you want to play good and, you know, you hope you play good. I think we play pretty good tonight. Well, in the lexicon of sports terminology, and I don't mean to sound contrary here, the word good falls tragically short of encompassing the sheer virtuosity of your performance this evening. Um, well, you know, there's no I in the word team, and this is a team effort, and I just want to say that I'm really proud to be associated with these fine individuals that I ha have the pleasure of working with. Now, I would never want to diss your teammates in any way, shape, or form, but you do realize that you smashed the bits Will Chamberlain's here to four unbreakable record of 100 points in a single basketball game set in Hershey, Pennsylvania all those years ago. Oh, man, you know, you just got to play one game at a time and go out there and give 110%, and I just got to show you want it more than they do when chips fall where they may. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Jerry and Dan. All right! Be up, <laughs> oh, Never my God. <laughs> uh, a couple of, you know what's funny just watching that? The, it, it, one, I, I never liked it when an athlete would answer any of my questions by looking off. 
Mm. And that means to kind of looking into the distance. I love, I, I'm huge on eye contact. And it, 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 that's, that tells me you've connected with the athlete a little bit. And just watching that clip, there's no, uh, there's no eye contact at all. And, of course, we rattle off all of the uh, – and both parties extremely guilty of rattling off as many cliches as possible. As I told you, I'm huge on conversation. It's got to sound like a conversation to me, and it can't sound like an interview. Some, some of the hosts get it. The three guys that I, I love, Howard Stern does a great interview now. Now that he's passed all the craziness – where he had to be the shock jock to get people to pay attention. He listens, and he's not afraid. He's very brave to go down different avenues and different streets, but he's also great at bringing it right back onto, onto the, the main avenue that he wants to go. Charlie Rose on PBS was fantastic at that. I always liked the one-on-one -on -one interviews over a table, dark background. Uh, Charlie, Charlie also is another brave individual who is not afraid to ask a tough question. James Lipton, the late great host of Inside the Actor's Studio, used to have a stack of blue cards. Like You want to talk about a guy who's done his homework, but he was never afraid if something came up because he was listening to what his guests were saying. He was never afraid to go somewhere else other than just off his blue cards. And a guy that I've known for a bunch of years, uh, I spent some time in Winnipeg and I got to know Scott Oak pretty well. Scott gets roasted, not annually, but daily because of offbeat questions he'll ask after games. But I usually find those questions are fun to listen for the answer. And he's also very brave and bold and asking players questions that are a little off the beaten path. And those four guys, uh, I, I have a huge tip of the cap to all four of those guys because because they show me that you sometimes, if you're listening to the, the guest properly, you can go in a different direction. Bryn, I am so uh, grateful for your time today. And, and I know you've been facing something much more difficult than an athlete interview. You were diagnosed with stomach cancer in January 2020, earlier this year. You've had your entire stomach removed, a gastrectomy. You've lost 130 pounds in a year. So rather cliche question, but how are you? I'm lighter. <laughs> I'm considerably lighter. It was last July and I weighed in at a ridiculous 273 pounds. And my doctor and I talked about, you know what? You got to lose some weight because I'm worried about your ticker and your blood pressure. And I, I totally agreed. but. When I got to September, I was a little off. I was having indigestion problems. And, you know, so my doctor and I were concerned and we ran some tests. But I went to the World Junior Hockey Championship this past uh, holiday season in the Czech Republic. I was doing a podcast from over there. And uh, all the way, th and they love their bratwurst, by the way. <laughs> they, they, they love their, the sausage and everything. And I ate so well but as the trip went along and for me it was a 23 day road trip i was over there for 23 days over christmas but i but my stomach was getting worse and worse and worse i get back from the czech republic and about a week later i collapsed uh in the bathroom i basically had passed out and what it was was it was uh, i had a bleeding ulcer but unfortunately the bleeding ulcer was right on top of a tumor in my stomach and my surgeon, I'm giving his name, Dr. Schiller, at the Royal Alex Hospital, and uh, thoracic surgeon, Dr. Johnson, they did a remarkable job of getting the tumor out. And I've since been cleared by the Cross Cancer Institute. It looks like that battle is over, but it hasn't been a fun seven months. And it's shut down my, my podcasting business for seven months. But you know what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the prognosis for me moving ahead because stomach cancer is a tough one to come back from. But here we are. I'm doing, this is the first podcast I've done since I've come back from this. And I hope that I'm able to do a million more of them. Well, you're ready for a comeback, Bryn, because you were fantastic today. Thanks. Thanks for your time, man. No, not a problem. And by the way, check out my uh, website. Can I give a plug to that? Of course. It's, it's mightymouth.ca. You can hear some of the podcasts that 
I did over in the Czech Republic. And I also do other podcasts. That some are self-help uh, with clients. I do corporate podcast work. So if, if I'm a corporation and I, I issue a newsletter because I have stakeholders, some people like to read and some people want to hear the message. So Absolutely. Bryn, Bryn, your business helps them create and disperse that podcast to the ears that are willing to listen. All you got to do is come into the studio or we do it uh, remotely, which is becoming more popular because of the times we're living in. And basically work with me. We get your message out. I'll do the editing at the front and the back end of it. And I'll get it up onto Apple or Google or Spotify. Spotify is, is my choice to listen to podcasts. But there's a lot of different ear candy out there. And so we'll get it to wherever you want to go. And, and you're right. You can include it in your emails and everything like that. Throw it on your, on your website. Thanks, Bryn. Your mouth is mighty once more. I know. I just don't know when to shut up. So I'm going <laughs> to shut up now. Thank you. We'll play the music. That'll, that'll be your cue. That'll be it. <laughs> if you'd like to send a message to my guest, Bryn Griffiths, you can email him at mightymouth at shaw.ca. If you liked what you heard on this podcast, we're hoping you choose to subscribe and receive updated episodes automatically. We're also hoping you choose to follow and rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever directory you're listening on. Josephine left a review. I love how you tell stories, highly engaging from start to finish. Amazing. Josephine, wow. thank you. I know. Start Where do to, I write the check? Start to finish. No, no checks. No checks. No I checks. don't accept. Nobody <laughs> writes checks anymore, Doug. I think, yeah, e-transfers, right? Yes. <laughs> Would you also do us a favor and recommend this podcast to one friend? And if you have an idea for an episode or you, you just want to tell us something, send us a note at info at jgrcommunications.com. Thanks for listening.